Thank you. Uh, we gave a huge round of applause to everybody involved except Dr. G. So I think he deserves it. So I'm going to start today by sharing a deeply personal story. Uh, this is actually an awesome story about how our family got a bonus three years with my father. Uh, this is also the best example I have of the creative application of data and technology. Uh, and where it started was in 2008, my father was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Uh, now, everybody uh, in this room is probably uh, quite aware of uh, what a grim prognosis that is. Uh, we were told that uh, there was nothing we can do. And it didn't matter all the leading institutions in the world. We traveled to Mayo and John Hopkins and Presbyterian and MD Anderson and all the leading experts in all the leading institutions. They told us the same thing. It's too late. There's nothing you can do. Uh, and this didn't reconcile for us because there's all these vibrant online patient communities uh, where people had self-identified as patients uh, and they had all been indicating to us that uh, uh, they're surviving with this condition. So we did a really scientific exercise. We went from ACOR to uh, patients like me and all these communities and being data geeks, we pulled out Excel. Uh, and what we started uh, to do was basically write down the first post date of every single individual. Uh, when we were done that exercise, a morbid realization came upon us. There were only 11 people uh, that had uh, been posting for over a year. So, of course, we made a personal appeal to all 11, saying, what are you doing? Tell us what you're, uh, what you're up to. Nine of them responded by the next morning, uh, and seven were on the same clinical trial, which was GTX. That almost immediately changed our family's life. Uh, my dad's markers went down. His energy level went up. We started to travel as a family, and we were having dinner almost every night as a family. That is almost 1,000 dinners that we got because we refused to blindly follow the expert advice. And I think that uh, that is really a great um, uh, uh, setup for one of the key messages of our presentation, which is that the data you have shapes how you see the world and how you see the world shapes the possibilities that are available to you. Now, that data was available, uh, but it required us taking a different lens to the data, pushing on the data, and challenging the expert opinion. There's another point uh, to that story, and that is that had that happened a decade earlier, none of those vibrant communities would have existed. And so I, I know that most of us, hopefully, are not dealing with life and death decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, but I challenge you to think about what decisions could benefit from new data sources, what data sources are hiding uh, behind your walls within your organizations or in your personal life that didn't maybe exist just a few years ago. Now, to really drive this point home, I want us to take a quick trip down memory lane, uh, and let's rewind the clock back all the way back to the 1960s where this was a real ad. Now, these physicians, they weren't trying to kill America. You know, the cigarettes made you feel good in the short term. And we didn't have the longitudinal data to suggest that this was actually a really bad idea. And this wasn't the first or last time, 30 years before that, radium. It made your skin glow, literally. <laughs> and 20 years before that, hallelujah, heroin from our friends at Bayer to treat your kid's cough. So these are crazy, ridiculous. Why would I start a presentation with three such outrageous examples? We are a group of educated people. Nobody in this room would accept the medical care of 50 years ago, let alone 100 years ago, and certainly not for anybody that you love. But I'm going to propose to you that most of us walk into work every single day, and we practice management rituals that are a lot older than any of these ads. Now, this isn't our idea. Uh, Gary Hamill, widely respected as the leading thinker on management today, points to the fact that management is a technology, and it's a technology that was largely invented at a time when we were changing from an agrarian society to an industrial society. So if you rewind the clock to back then, change was very slow. Computers were people doing long division. And you had all of these agrarian practices that were all annualized that ended up making their way into our workplace. Now, around that same time, Henry Ford said something that I think is even more relevant today. And he said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So I'm going to propose to you that a lot of the tools that we use on a day-to-day -day basis are basically just faster horses. Email, by way of an example, is simply a digitized memo. Even the language of email traces its roots through the carbon copy. We believe that email is a great way to let other people reprioritize your day for you. And if you think about it, it's actually worse because email gives people the illusion that they're moving faster while constantly interrupting them throughout their day and leaving very sparse time and flow. 
Now, email is not alone. Data, too, has been around for a very long time. Every company on the screen here, they use data. They use data to optimize supply chains. They use data to maximize margins and to market to us in increasingly more precise ways on their terms. And then a new wave of companies came in and disrupted all of our norms. And they use data, too. And they use data for the same purposes as Kodak and uh, Blockbuster and all these organizations. But they also understood that one of the deepest rooted human emotions is the feeling of being understood. And you could say that all of these companies collectively uh, did one thing that was really incredible, and that is they shifted the data lens, this time to be in the service of their customers, to better empower their customers, to better enable their customers. And in doing so, they were able to disrupt industries. So I want to start with a deceptively simple question. And that is, what would happen if organizations were as obsessed with understanding their own talent, their own people, as they are their customers? And it's a deceptively simple question because you know the answer and the benefits. This is an educated room. This is why Amazon does such a good job of showing you what you're interested in. It's why applications like Facebook spend so much time curating a news feed just for you. And applications like Spotify and Netflix are actually differentiated on these algorithms that learn our preferences so that they can customize our experiences. So the question is why? Uh, and I'm going to propose to you that the answer is that at home we have choice. And so over the last few decades, what we've done is we've exercised that choice and we've chosen to do business with companies that take the time to understand us and to personalize our news, shopping, travel, entertainment, and other needs. But then we walk into work, and at work we're still beholden to these one-size-fits-all processes, policies, tools, and the result is the largest unengagement levels in history. Uh, this is the Gallup data here in the US. If you go around the world, the Hewitt data ends up coalescing at around the same spot. 70% of workers being disengaged at work, and the result is that the average lifespan of an S&P 500 company is dropping to about 12 years. This is adjusted for M&A transactions. You're still at under 17 years. So why are these companies going from 70-year survival uh, to anywhere between 12 and 17 years? Uh, and I think it is that disengagement at work. That same data that I pointed to had 24% of people being actively disengaged. That means they wake up in the morning, they shower, they change, they get dressed, they drive into work, and then they spend their entire day deliberately undermining the missions of the companies that employ them. <laughs> Not funny, because it's going to require people at work to solve all of humanity's greatest, uh, greatest challenges. And whether your biggest issue is climate change, poverty, healthcare, education, whatever it is that's most important to you, consider that it's going to require organizations. Those organizations are going to have managers, and management is a technology. Now, the good news, if you think about technology more broadly, we've changed industries tremendously over the last 100 years. Think about the state of healthcare, automotive, aerospace, high tech. Consider how much progress we've made over the last 100 years. Now, contrast that with work then and now. So you could say that differently. You could say that the technology has radically transformed industries, technology is rapidly evolving, and the technology of management is actually not keeping pace. And then the question is, what can we do about that now? And that's really uh, uh, what we want to zoom into. To set that up, uh, I want to just pick on a few of these uh, relics from our agrarian roots. The annual performance review, this is an educated room. If I were to ask you what's wrong with it or do you like doing it, everybody would have an answer. Recency bias, point in time, attached to compensation, highly political. There's all of these reasons. We'd all be right. 97.2% of us do them. 98% of us believe that they suck. And 58% of the people that design them agree that they suck. And we still do them. This is what training looked like 50 years ago. This is more like training now. It's a little bit unfair because we have digitized it. It's now on a screen. Uh, but it's still fundamentally the same because it's delivered point in time and highly role-based. It's not delivered at a teachable moment. It's not delivered in a bite-sized way uh, that can help to coach us to greater performance. And then process is where we see the biggest opportunity. Organizations today, we're drowning in process. We have process for everything. We have process for planning and process for budgeting, process for approvals. We have process to change process and process to communicate and train on the now change process. It's too much. It's like this plaque clogging organizational arteries. And people know it because we've created new crafts to lean out process. If you think about what is happening in organizations, as companies get bigger, 
process is a great risk mitigation strategy. So what do we do? We make mistakes. We do a post-mortem. We figure out, could have cut it here. Uh, update the process documents, new SOPs, new training binders, new orientation materials. And now everybody will forever be slower because one nincompoop figured out one way not to do things. The alternative is to recognize that we're living at a time where we've developed an abundance of new capabilities to store and process data. Why is it that the first time and the hundredth time that anybody does anything that the process should be the same? The first time is truly a teachable moment. That's a great time to pair that person up with an expert. It's a great time to deliver a training intervention precisely when the individual is able to get the practice and feedback they need to learn. But as people demonstrate competence, we should be able to relax the bureaucracy. Now the really frustrating part, who in this room wrote down step-by-step -step directions on how to get here today? Who in this room writes down step-by-step -step directions on how to get anywhere? We've actually become quite comfortable with allowing technology to act as a coach for us in our personal lives. Now, these mapping applications, there's amazing things that they're doing behind the scenes to understand our location and figure out the routing and layer on ambient data like traffic. But to a consumer, it's turn left, turn right, and I just follow that, and it makes my life easier. Now, in the high-performance world of Formula One racing, this has been going on for a very long time. Uh, in fact, Ferrari was the first to have one of these. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, what's on the screen is a sensing and actuating center. And these, this is now table stakes uh, in, uh, in, in uh, high performance Formula One racing. And the reason is that every team thinks they're coming in with the winning strategy. Every pit crow is two seconds. The car technology is so regulated. Of course, the driver is really important. But on race day, it's too cold or it's too hot. An accident happens. An oil spill happens. Something happens. And it turns out that being able to crunch through billions of data points in real time and whisper in the driver's ear things like, you can skip the pit, or you can go harder on the brakes. That is the difference that made the difference. And today, that's table stakes in the industry. Now, the really good news, most of the businesses that are represented in this room don't need billions of data points in real time in order to optimize uh, their strategy. So I want to leave you with uh, uh, three principles for how we think about uh, this disruption that's happening and a lens that you could put to any business, uh, and then three examples. Uh, so the first one is really this notion of technology acting as a coach. Today, in most businesses, technology is like this angry referee. It yells offside after something has happened. And it's because it's business rules driven. So a business rule is triggered, a spreadsheet is emailed to you, it's all read, and it's too late. Uh, but in our personal life, these technologies are starting to try to understand us. And in doing so, they're able to whisper in our ear and act like a coach. Uh, and that is very different than how we talk about the consumerization of, of, of the workplace, because it's largely focused on the user experience as opposed to the true understanding of the individual. The second is this notion of data as a sixth sense. And the idea is not that this becomes your primary sense, but that data can start to be paired with the experience and wisdom of individuals. And that requires an organization that's committed to instrumenting the right way and informing the intuition of people by showing them lead and not lag metrics at the right time. Uh, and then the last one is probably the most provocative, uh, and that's really this notion of uh, ecosystems prevailing over hierarchies or the ability to engineer ecosystems. If you think about how influence is gained on the web, it's largely merit-based. Uh, and if you think about the future of the workplace, I think you'll recognize that the hierarchy is one of the reasons uh, that larger organizations tend to move slower. So three examples uh, to just uh, start your thought process on that. UPS company that is not widely respected as the most innovative, but they had a real problem. Lots of urban areas with lots of congestion uh, started to see accident rates going up, started to see drivers uh, having higher churn, and empathize with the driver for a moment. You got 12 packages to deliver, two are high priority, you're measured on mileage, you're measured on customer satisfaction, you know there's an accident up ahead. Sure, you might have a Waze, but Waze doesn't factor for all these variables that you're being asked to factor, like, like gasoline use. So they decided we're going to collapse all this information that we have about what our best drivers do. We're going to turn it into 80 pages of math. We'll toss it up on a heads-up display. And you can imagine when they showed this to the drivers, they were so thrilled about it. <laughs> You're going to turn us into robots. So, so the, they did something interesting, though. They didn't push it down. They took a step back and they said, OK, we'll run an experiment. Uh, it's a very powerful uh, way to, to reconcile this challenge. Cohort number one, you were actually excited about uh, Orion. For this experiment, we're asking you to use Orion and please follow the suggestions. Uh, cohort number two, I mean, we know you said you didn't want it. We installed it in your car, uh, but override it if you want. Like, use your experience, use your wisdom. You feel free to override it. Just 
know that it's there. And cohort number three, you're so adamant that this will suck, you don't get Orion. And of course, and this is a spoiler alert if you uh, do decide to read our book, in our research, it's always cohort number two. It's always the teams that are able to take people with experience and wisdom and then give them that intelligence advantage uh, right at the time of need uh, that wins. Interesting, just entertain yourself. If you're in a major urban area, follow a UPS truck because they were able to uh, uh, discover unusual insights that they would have never been able to. So for example, almost all their accidents were happening during left-hand turns. So follow a UPS truck, you'll see they make a lot of rights. Uh, <laughs> Number two, they were able to reduce in major areas uh, mileage usage by as much as 20 miles per day. That's great for polar bears, that's great for profits, and all this data is published uh, by UPS if, uh, if you want to look at it. Whole Foods, largely known as, uh, as a really conscious grocer, an incredible organization. What most people don't know is that they're by far the most advanced with their data practices, certainly of any uh, retailer that we studied. And what they do is once a week they ship the kind of information that you would expect that stores could use for merchandising purposes, advertising that's happening in the area, and a whole bunch of uh, competitive intelligence. The store managers are entirely empowered uh, to decide on pricing strategy. They can decide to sell something at a loss. Uh, once a month, those store managers are given a package uh, that would be mind-blowing to most retail organizations. That package includes all of the data across the entire Whole Foods universe. And in fact, it's so much uh, cost level data that's sensitive, like people's salaries, and not for your store, not for your region, not for your country, not just for retail, but the entire executive, the entire organization globally. To the extent that the SEC came in, and this was right after their performance started to pick back up and said, no, 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 you can't do this. You're making all of your people an insider. To which they said, have you seen our recent numbers? We trust our people. We'll figure out a different way to incentivize them. And today, they've got thousands of people listed as insiders. Uh, last example, if you're not familiar with uh, Valve, you should be. Uh, Valve is uh, one of the most profitable gaming companies in the world, uh, an incredible organization uh, that has no managers. In fact, they have no titles. So you may say to me, that's chaos. Like, How do people uh, know what projects they're going to work on? How do they?" Uh, get assigned to those projects. Well, it's actually very simple. What they did is they gave everybody a desk with wheels. And if you're not happy with the project you're on, you can wheel yourself over to another team where you can contribute. So you may say, well, that's still total chaos because how would that work? And the reality is they've given this high level of autonomy, uh, but they've coupled it with a high level of accountability. And the way that they are creating the accountability is everything that they launch, they understand the contribution of those specific projects. At the end of every project, they've created a culture that's so mature that they rank order each other's contribution. So when you start wheeling yourself over to another desk, you better make sure that you're wheeling yourself over to a project where you can be of, of high contribution. Uh, and this is just a, one of many models that are starting to emerge. Valve is a completely radically open organization. You can see their handbook and everything online. Uh, lots of interesting stuff to learn there. So I want to leave you with uh, one last thought, and that is that this is not about thinking about your tools. This is really about thinking about your thinking. Uh, because Einstein said you can't solve today's problems with the same thinking that created them. And I would propose to you that it's going to require more than just progressive leadership, but progressive leadership instrumented and supported in the right way uh, in order to get that 70% re-engaged and, uh, and move forward. Thank you all so much.